Chris forgot to shoot an intro. So here I am and I'm just gonna do his bit. So welcome to Palatech and roll intro. Hi everyone and welcome to Pal the Tech. Today we're talking about ISO invariance and how it affects your photos. And most importantly, how you would use ISO invariance to better improve the images that you take. To understand ISO invariance, you must first understand the basics of what ISO is. Now I already have a few videos on that topic, but to put it simply, ISO is the amplification of the electrical charge that is created as a result of light photons hitting your camera's sensor. Now, the higher that you set your ISO dial, the more aggressively your camera will amplify this electrical charge and the brighter that your resulting image will appear. But there's a trade-off. When you increase ISO, you also increase the noise in your image. Not only that, but you end up with less dynamic range and you increase the risk of highlight clipping and you can get poor skin tones. As a general rule, you want to keep your ISO set as low as possible in the camera when you take your shot. However, it's not possible to do this in many cases. Let's say I want to take a photo of my hand moving back and forth inside this low light indoor situation without a flash. I have my lens open as wide as possible to let in as much light as possible and right now the camera is telling me that if I shoot at ISO 160 which is the lowest base ISO and I have my shutter speed set at 125 I will have good exposure okay so let me take the shot. And here's the problem, motion blur. I need a faster shutter speed. Does that make sense? So in order to freeze the action of my hand, I have to increase the shutter speed. Let's say I increase it from 1 1 25th of a second to 1 1 1,000th of a second. That is an extra three stops. But look at this, the scene is now underexposed by three stops because I increase the shutter speed, faster shutter, less light, so it's underexposed by three stops. So what's left to do? I have to increase the ISO. So the amplification of the electrical charge on the sensor. So I'm going to go ahead and increase my ISO by about three stops. Now, if you see the scene, it's properly exposed, more or less, and I get my shutter speed of one one thousandth of a second, and I can now take my shot and not have that motion blur. See that right here? And even looking at that shot, it's still a little blurry, so I'm gonna bump up my shutter speed now to one four thousandth of a second. That'll guarantee to freeze the action. Of course, now I have to bump up my ISO. I'm gonna go ahead and do both. And take the shot again. And as you can see, I have frozen the action, prevented the motion blur, and gotten the shot that I want. But I was only able to do this by increasing the ISO on the camera. Okay, so now, what is ISO invariance? If you have a camera that's ISO invariant, such as this Fujifilm X-T4, this means that you should get the exact same image quality whether you brighten the image by raising the ISO on the camera or you brighten the image later on in post-production. I'm gonna shoot this scene right here. The camera is telling me that in order to get a perfect exposure, I need to shoot at ISO 6400 if my other exposure triangle settings are set at f6.4 at 1 500th of a second. Okay, now here are my two images. The image on the left was shot setting the ISO on the camera to ISO 6400. According to the exposure meter on the camera, this was the correct ISO to use if my aperture was set to f6.4 and my shutter speed to 1 500th of a second. Now here's my other image. Everything is exactly the same with what you just saw except for one major difference. In this shot, I did not raise my ISO. Instead, I left left it set at ISO 200. And yes, I know that the lowest base ISO on the X-T4 camera is actually ISO 160, and I could have used that. But I wanted to use ISO 200 in these examples as it's easier to visualize the exposure stop differences I'm about to discuss. So everything else in this image is the same, except I didn't raise the ISO in camera to the recommended ISO of 6400. So we have two shots, one correctly exposed in camera and the the other shot is five stops underexposed. And if you think about it, this makes perfect sense. I shot the second photo at ISO 200, which is one, two, three, four, five stops under 
ISO 6400. So this is where ISO invariance comes into play. If I return to my post-production editing of this RAW file and I drag the exposure slider one, two, three, four, five stops brighter, this has pretty much the same effect as raising the ISO in camera by five stops. Here they are side by side and the noise level is about the same. Zooming in at 100%, Note that I say pretty much the same, and that's because they are not quite exactly 100% the same. Meaning that an ISO invariance range of five stops is large enough of an exposure change that it does add a little bit of post-production noise that wasn't there before. Have a look at this right here. You see the shot on the right? You see how there's a little more noise right here but I am zoomed in at 300%. These are pretty much the same at 100%. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is ISO invariance. It doesn't matter whether you set ISO in camera or you do it in post-production. I will have links to additional videos down below if you would like to take a deeper dive into the finer details of ISO and Fujifilm cameras. Now, for our purposes today, the important question becomes, why would you want to care about or use ISO invariance anyway? Way. Why not always just set the correct ISO in camera instead of later on adjusting it in post-production? One word, flexibility. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, let's say you're shooting this scene here at night. Let's also assume that I want to shoot at 1 30th of a second at f5.6 to achieve my artistic creative vision. If I want to be sure that my background, in this case, this color chart, see that, is exposed brightly enough so that you can see it, then I must raise my ISO to 12,800. However, you can see from my histogram that in doing so, I am clipping my highlights. You see that right there? So instead, what I'll do is lower the ISO down by two stops to 3200. This better exposes in camera for my highlights. You see that? However, the background is now underexposed and you can't see it as well. But that's okay, I know this already and I plan on raising this back up in post-production by two stops. But, and here's the big reason here, I am going to selectively do this. I'm gonna leave the highlights alone in my foreground and instead better bring up the darker areas of my image. If I use the ISO dial on the top of the camera at the time I took the shot, then I was forced to bring up the brightness in the entire image. But if I use the exposure slider, I can selectively apply the ISO brightness to various parts of the image that I think need it. Here are my two images right here. Image on the left, the ISO was set to 12,800, which the camera told me was the correct value at the time I took the shot. Image on the right, I decided to lower the ISO to 3,200 to get rid of the clipped highlights. So have a look at this. I have exposed much better for the bright areas of the image. The eye isn't blown out, you see that? And if you're Muno and you only have one eye, you don't want to blow it out. Same thing right here, you can see the bulb much better, it is not overexposed. But have a look at the background. You see right here, I have a lot of noise in this background. It brought up a lot of noise. I can see the background over here, not so much. So now what I'm gonna do is selectively bring up the background, but now because I'm doing it in post-production, I have control over what areas of the image I'm gonna bring up and how much I can bring it up. So in Lightroom, I'm now gonna bring up the radial gradient just over the area of the part I wanna brighten. And I'm gonna start to brighten it a little bit. You see that? Have a look at this. So I didn't even bring it up two stops. I'm gonna bring it up 1.67 of a stop, okay? But now if you look at these two photos, the original one I shot and the one I just edited, I was able to bring back some exposure to only the background, only the background. And here's the best part, have a look at this. There is slightly less noise in the edited version than in the original version that I shot. And that's because remember when I had originally shot that version, I had set the ISO to 12,800 for the entire photo. But in the edited version using the mask, I only needed to bring up the exposure to about 1.67, not even two. So I needed less of it to a specific area of the image to achieve what I wanted to have in the shot. In working with Fuji, Film cameras, I can tell you some general tips that will maybe make this work better for you. 
First, before considering anything else, see if you can keep the lowest base ISO, which in the case of an X-T4 and an X-T3 is ISO 160, and adjust your shutter speed or f-stop instead. If you can do that and not compromise the type of shot that you're taking, this is pretty much the best route to go. You get the shot you want and you don't have to worry about the increased noise or other problems that higher ISO brings to your image. Now, if you're shooting between ISO 800 and and 6400, don't let that worry you too much. Fujifilm cameras handle ISOs in this range very well. Just make sure though that you are always using a histogram to protect your highlights when shooting scenes with high dynamic range. Now, if you're needing to shoot at ISO 6400 and higher, try sticking the camera in 6400, right, in camera, and then bumping up the exposure later on in post-production. Shooting at this high of an ISO will be a problem with noise no matter what you do, but by at least staying at 6400 on the dial and moving the rest of the exposure up in post-production, you give yourself more control over how much noise that you want to introduce. And speaking of introductions, Ladies and gentlemen, we have not one, not two, but three new Gear Iguana members for the Hall of Fame. First, we have Matt Marino. And second, we have Stephen Hayden. And third, we have Eamon McKay. Gentlemen, thank you so much. Let's get your names on the Gear Iguana Wall of Fame. Well, there they are, permanently on the studio wall, just out of frame of the camera, but they're there. Thank you so much for your support. This was such a bright spot to see this come in, and it just meant the world to me. Thank you. Now, back to me in the studio. Before I go, I want to thank all of you who contacted me and gave me a heads up about that spam incident. For those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, see my other video called An Important Message to All Subscribers. I really appreciate the help and the patience while we had to sort through all that. But just know that I will never be putting my phone number in the comments like that. And hopefully once this channel hits 100,000 subscribers, I can get some kind of verification badge so that you'll know it's a legit comment from my account. In the meantime, if you see those spam comments, use common sense. And just ignore them. <clears throat> okay, so here's what happened. Chris completely forgot to shoot both an intro and an outro for this video. And not only that, but he's re still responding to questions and comments about the comment spam incident from a few days ago. And so I'm doing the outro for him. Okay, so let me see if I got this right. Well, thank you so much for watching, and I really hope that you enjoyed this video. And if you did, be sure to give it a like and subscribe. I'm gonna be signing off for now, but have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you all in new videos next week. Take care.